And we're live. Here we go. Good day, Whiskey Brothers and Sisters. Welcome to the Whiskey Book Club's fifth book review, third edition of The Language of Whiskey by David McNichol. As always, we're honored to have you, the viewer, and our panel with us here today. My name's Dolph. I'm the president of the Alberta Scott Society, uh, founder of the Whiskey Book Club, and I'm your host tonight. Those of you that are new to us, have never seen this before, I'll tell you a little bit what we're doing. We're a bunch of whiskey geeks that love to share a dram, these drams right here, and share our passion for reading, mostly about whiskey or whiskey-related activities. The choice of our fifth book, right there, is a return to our roots, a return to Scotch. We've done so for the last two weeks, and we'll do so again for the next two weeks. And here, I'll not cover the name. That's good. And we're doing it with our whiskey spirit guide, David Nichol. I like that. The whiskey spirit guide. That's what he is for us. So uh, I mentioned this before, but it, it really bears repeating. Our guest of honor, David here, is the author, of course. He is a whiskey aficionado who was born, raised in the Highlands, went to the University of Aberdeen, worked at Blair Athol, Owns a travel company called Scottish Roots, which specializes in whiskey and ancestral travel. He moved to New York 10 years ago, and he's been a brand ambassador for several labels there in the States. And in New York, he teaches all things Scottish at the Brooklyn Brainery. Brainery. Brooklyn Brainery. It shouldn't be that hard to say. I need a little bit more of my scotch. So let's start our roundtable introductions with your names, your other handles, What's in your glasses, and a little bit more tonight. Why you picked what's in your glass tonight? If you could do that, um, and we'll we'll start with David, of course, and then we'll go alphabetically with Dave, Drew, Sheila, Kent, and Cheryl. Thanks, everyone. Let's do it. Well, thanks very much, Dolph. Good to be back again and uh, and see everybody and uh, talk about all things Scottish and all things Scotch and. Uh, in my glass again tonight, I've got a little uh, a little Glenfiddich 15. Uh, why? I think it, it ties back nicely with our with our heritage. So, fine. Beautiful. Thank you so much. And Dave, you're up. All right. Hey guys, it's uh, Yukon Dave coming from his basement again. I actually got this in the right position. You Today do. Today I'm drinking. Well, it just happened to pop in there. I'm drinking Scarabus. It's a uh, it's a blend, and I picked it because Mark at the Whiskey Whistle had picked that for his. Was it last year's Whiskey of the Year? Okay. Yeah. And it's a good choice. You also had the other choice of Bladnock, I thought you are going to have tonight. And we I'm tried that, that together. It was fantastic. Yeah. And it was all over all over Instagram, so I got on it. Yeah. And uh, who actually said it was one of his top of the year? Ralphie said that, too. So it's well, going to run out. It always does when Ralphie has okay. come. Good job, Dave. Thanks. Kent, you're up. Hi, my name is Kent. Go by Whiskey Dad. Sorry, 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 sorry. Oh, we're gonna. There we go. That's much better. I guess starting with me. So, yeah. I'm double fisting it here. I start with the Black Diamond, the spiced cranberry, brand new product out. Thought we'd give it a try, and it's also from a local distillery. And then, of course, in the other hand, I've got myself an Old Claire. Um, number four released. So there again, a brand new release from a local company here, producing spirits. So my name's Cheryl, and I go by Cheryl's underscore one. Perfect. And welcome. And my name is Kent. I go by Whiskey Ass on most platforms. Um, I'm also double fisting tonight. So we're going to start off uh, another local brewery here. And well, you know, a little bit of a run on from last month for the beer. And um, I decided to kick back into my Aki because it's been a while and this bottle is getting a little down. So we might have to do a bottle kill on it and <laughs> make sure it doesn't get too oxidized on us. I agree. <laughs> that should be gone tonight. And <laughs> Sheila, you're up. Um, I am uh, Sheila. I go by Anconi on uh, all social medias. I am drinking uh, Famous Grouse uh, Ruby Cast, so the Port Cast strength. Tonight, um, I picked it because my dad used to always bring uh, Famous Grouse home whenever we would come home from visiting. Um, and my uh, in-laws actually shipped it home from us. Uh, they live in Ontario. We can't get it in Alberta, so they uh, shipped a bottle up for us. Good to have friends and family around the country, isn't it? <laughs> Drew? Uh, I'm Drew. Uh, at your Semper on most of the platforms um i'm having the black bottle 
because uh, the these chapters of the birth sections of the chapters of the book was going into the uh, original lending families and all the rest. So I thought uh, I'd go with Black Bottle. Perfect. Thank right. you, kind right. sir. And if uh, we're back to me, I'm double fisting it as well, but on two two whiskeys. And they're pretty good boards too. I'm pretty happy, uh, but but I'm taking uh, it, it's David that influenced me because he was saying in his book we read and I can't remember the page, uh, Ben Riek was one of his favorite. I don't know if he said it was his favorite, absolute favorite. So I don't know which one was his favorite. So I've got this one, the Madeira Cat, the 13 year old, and the Curiosity. So I've got both, and. We'll see which one I like better, but I, I love Mandira Cast, so I'm probably partial to that. But the Curiosity is fantastic. So, uh, David, which one was it, or is it neither of them? Some other? I have a feeling it's neither. So, uh, <laughs> That's so right. the Curiosity is very good, uh, but uh, I think that I, I have a feeling I put Ben Rinnis, but I'm not sure. Maybe it's Ben Rinnis. It might be. I got some Ben Rinnis back there too. Oh, yeah. I'll, that up. I'll triple fist it for you. Triple guys. fist it. Yeah. All right, I'll do it. Okay. Uh, welcome to one and all. Thank you very much. And the people on the side, uh, who wants to take care of the comments on the side tonight? Any any volunteers? I've got it for YouTube. I'm not sure who's managing Facebook. Uh, I, can, I can jump over there as well. Perfect. Thank you very much, lady and gentlemen. So let's start this off. And I, I this is really important, this first part, because this was bugging me for a while. I, I, since the very first I opened this book, this book right here, I've been searching for a description of the type of book it would be. Uh, since the first pages, we've seen that this book is etymological, geographical, historical, and it weaves a story that goes through all these descriptors to give us what I think is probably the most complete understanding of Scotch that we could possibly ask for. But there was always something elusive, something that I just couldn't wrap my head around. And I believe I finally figured it out. I was pretty happy with myself. So a little bit of background. I've done a lot of, I'm a teacher. I've done a lot of traveling with school groups over the past 25 years. And in that time, I've had good, great, and fantastic trips. What would make them great would be the food, the destination, the weather, and a whole bunch of other variables. But what would make it fantastic, absolutely fantastic, would be all that I described and the people, the students, the other teachers coming with me, and inevitably the tour guides. What we have in this book is the very best tour guide possible. That's, that's what I came up with. And it, it really hit home because a couple of his descriptions, David's descriptions, is like he's a tour guide and you're in the bus and he's, he's waiting your attention on one side to look at something. So he's, he's a tour guide that's got the knowledge they're passionate and the tour guides you like the most and they have a desire to share what they love, which in this case is Scotland and one of its best byproducts, scotch. So that's what I came up with and I was happy. It might not be an epiphany moment for everybody and it might be really obvious for everyone else, but it was for me and I'm really happy. So David, thank you for doing this book for us. And I, I'm not sure if you agree with the analysis, but would you consider, if you consider it a possibility, was it by design, or has your role as a tour guide company supplanted itself on your subconscious? Or, alternately, is it <laughs> knowledge that you own Scottish roots made me think that it's a tour guide book? Oh. Uh, well, I'll say, first of all, the check is in the post. Either that, you're doing the forward for the next book. Uh, thank you. Yeah, I don't know. I, 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 when you, when you send that in the email to me, I, was, I, I guess... I guess it has to be. I guess a bit of subconscious going in there. I mean, I wanted it to be obviously, we said right at the beginning, this a departure from the usual scratch and sniff, uh, and and somebody else's opinion on what you know should inform you. You know, whiskey should be a very personal experience, and also a little bit more um, on the the background and, and the, the social history of everything. And the the hook was very much the language side of it because nobody had really dive deep into that but i guess after 12 years of writing uh travel itineraries and putting tours together and having driven and guided most of them i guess i guess it's hard to shake that off so yeah i i i, I guess the mind process was that that a to b to c uh, and you know on your left hand side you will see and on your right hand side you will see but more than just point and shoot it was about 
well, what are you looking at when when you're when you're looking? So it was trying to bring that to life. So yeah, I, I'd never really consider it as being a, not a travel log as such, but but being you know that kind of that kind of guidebook. Yeah. So yes, I do agree. Well, it feels like it, but in a very good way. And like I said, with the tour guides, what made all my trips that much better was someone that was passionate about it. So the passion comes through. And the, the obviously the history and the knowledge right there. So I love it. It was fantastic. And we're only halfway through it, guys. So, well, it's just a little <laughs> bit over half. Though, so we're good. Uh, we're going to start with one of the questions that we had last week or we were going to deal with last week from section one of the book. So, David, you highlight the Barons and when they broke into the market with their blends. So Chivas Brothers, Johnny Walker's sons, William Teacher, Arthur Bell, Canada's own Jimmy Buchanan with black and white. Whit McKay, uh, Matthew Glow, the Grouse Blend, which goes great with what Sheila has. And the Graham Brothers, Black Bottle, which goes great with what Drew has. So, panel, uh, do you have a favorite among these whiskeys of the blends that I mentioned? you have something in there that just sticks with you a little bit? Well, I'll start because I don't... I haven't really drank any of the blends that you mentioned, but this Scarabus is a blend, so that's kind of why I brought it on tonight. And I really like this one. And I've, I was at the Toronto airport. Anybody seen the uh, the, the Johnny Walker display at the in airport Toronto? in Toronto? No. It's amazing all the different distilleries they buy from. Yeah. And I sat there and I read all the all the labels from this. Like they they must buy a lot of good whiskey. <laughs> well, there's still a lot. So it's, yeah, yeah. And the whiskey's so, the heart of the blend. So yeah. Now, so she, uh, go ahead, Dave. Well, I'm kind of new to the blend, so like I'm happy with this one. So I'll probably look at a few more. Yeah, I'm a little bit new to the blends too. So I'm thinking last three years is really when I started getting into blends. So I don't know if you're like me, a little bit of a Scotch snob. Yeah. We snub and I'm <laughs> getting into it, but it was Compass Box that drove me into the blends. And yeah. yours, yours, buddy. Yours, I'm yeah. absolutely amazed for like such a cheap whiskey how decent it is. Yeah. Price point, what 30, 35 Canadian? Yeah. Yeah. Yep. Okay. Good okay. nice Sheila, you're I, gonna stick with Grouse. I, I have a soft spot for Grouse just because of my dad, but I love Compass Box. I my if you were to go yeah. into our whiskey room, I have an entire shelf full of compass box. I can't walk by a compass box and not fall in love with it. I just I love what they're doing. Yeah. And so I really you'll be at our it. next tasting on December eleventh, yeah. I'm already signed up. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. And Drew, um, black bottle. Have you um, had the old black bottle, Drew? Say again. Did you have the old black bottle? No, no, we don't we don't well, I've, have, I've had some. You've I've had some. Yeah, no, but we didn't have we don't no, we I mean, like, I've drank it. it in the past and remember. Yeah. It. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah I'll, I'll, famous grouse, dwarves, or black bottle, depending on the mood of the day. Um, a good go to daily one. <laughs> okay. All right, David, do you have a favorite out of any of those? Well, the, I guess one of the questions that you asked was where did you, you – know, when did you stumble across it? Well, stumbling perhaps is the right word. The, your introduction to whiskey in Scotland is generally through the blend. Uh, you, you, it's, a, it's a step up to go from there into, into the world of single malts, mainly because, you know, they weren't as accessible people, you know, famous grouse, Johnny Walker, and then in, particularly in, in the UK, it's, Be it's Bells and Grouse. So Bells is the biggest – selling uh, blend in the United Kingdom and Famous Grouse is the biggest selling blend in Scotland. Uh, so I guess, I mean, the Famous Grouse at the heart of Famous Grouse is Glen Turret Distillery, which is 20 miles from where I grew up. And I actually quite like their, um, their, their Black Grouse, the Black Cock. And one of the, re I guess one of the reasons that is that I, the, the heart of the Bells blend is Blair Athol. Uh, they, that was the, the Black Bottle for the, the, the Black Cock for the Grouse was the gift I gave uh, my father-in-law, my father and my ushers and best man at my wedding. And they, they, you can get your name signed onto the onto the bottles nice. at Down Ackland. Yeah. Now, I don't know if they're still doing that because of the changeover and who's bought and Matthew Glow doesn't right, have right, to yeah. it anymore. But they, so there used to be a Bell's blend called Bell's Islander. So Bell's yeah. Islander was very much like their eight-year-old blend, but they must have dialed up 
the Talisker or the, the Kalila in it. So it was a smokier, slightly smokier, slightly oilier version of their regular bells. And it was quite similar to that Black Grouse for the uh, for that. So yeah, I, those were those I, Grouse and Bells I, I grew up with and you know, you expand from all that. But I have to say that yeah, Compass Box has taken blending to a completely different uh, yeah. level altogether. I mean, I've, I, as you know, I've known Robin a long time and uh, right from the, the get-go when John first came into New York and hedonism and, you know, Spice Tree and such. Just fantastic, fantastic stuff. That first well, Spice Tree just knocked my socks off yeah. for the longest time. The first 100%. one. The second, not as much, but that first Spice Tree. I think that's one of the things with Compass Box is that you find a really good one and then you realize that the next turnout is not... It, there's, it, because of that, it's brilliant to have the changeability. But it's uh, it's hard to nail the one that you really like and keep it. Yeah, that, that and, and I don't want to be critical because the subsequent ones were good. <laughs> that first one just blew my mind. One hundred percent. Dave, well, I think, sorry, I cut you off, Dave, buddy. So no, that's okay. It, uh, I'm just going to put my hand up when I'm going to ask a question, so I don't run over top of somebody. I've got a kind of a odd question. What's the drinking age in Scotland? And then the second part is that. Well, when do you guys actually start drinking scotch? Well, the, the legal age is eighteen. Okay. Well, the 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 law says that you you can drink alcohol um, at home uh, from the age of five. Now you can drink it in a restaurant. Or nobody nobody's drinking scotch at the age of five. <laughs> but you can you can drink wine or beer in a restaurant or a pub with parental consent as long as you're eating food at the age of sixteen. So the age of drinking alcohol legally is 16, I would say. But being able to buy alcohol, drink alcohol is 18. I would say that the the spirit of choice, certainly when I was that age growing up, would have been vodka. Vodka was the alcohol of choice. It, you were sold a lie, you know, the whole thing, or oh, your parents won't smell it on your breath, that kind of thing. Yeah. They'll never they'll never know you've been drinking. The fact you're like <laughs> bouncing off the walls and do, doing what they call the Glasgow waltz, <laughs> trying to get out the garden path. Uh, but I, I always, I always enjoyed the whiskey. I mean, talking about Dewar's as a whiskey, my grandfather worked for Dewar's. My grandfather was a stillman at Aberfeldy, so my grandmother used to get hampers full, full of Dewar's. And I, as a Scotsman, I, I, I guess I raided the cabinet when I was fourteen, fifteen. That's a late start for, for Scotland. So, but uh, so yeah, I, I would say we probably get indoctrinated into it. But it's that whole thing. My, my other grandmother was a bit more teetotaler, and she would be like, "Demon drink, demon drink, demon drink." Happy eighteenth birthday! There's a bottle of whiskey. <laughs> <laughs> Part of the club now. I'm sure yeah. you made up for it. You started late, but yeah, I'm sure you made up. Oh, for it. yes, yes, hundred percent. All right. <laughs> yeah. no, we're starting our second section of the book right now, so it's entitled "A Noble Heritage Written Stone," and with this new section comes a new quote. And uh, I'll, I'll put that up. And one that I love, and another one that introduces our subject matter for the next two weeks. So it's going to be two quotes in a row, if that's all right. Everybody, here's the first one, and I'm going to read it. Uh, Scotch whiskey is a little bit like Scots themselves, rooted in history, a strong sense of tradition, and welcome at every party. Now, it didn't link to anything that we're talking about tonight, really, but I really, really like that quote. So um, I'll put Irishman in there every once in a while because I got Irish Scott blood. So whoever is in the party with me, I'll quote it. I'll just change that word if that's okay, David. And uh, my next one here, what's that? There we And you said absolutely. I've got this on. I've got it on tape. So we're good. <laughs> I've got the proof I need. So, And uh, the second one, yet one of the key elements to any presentation, whether on the box or by a brand ambassador, is to reach back to the heritage of the brand, to the history. Each tells its own tale and is often reflective of the social history of a particular area. So this is a new element to our journey. We haven't talked about social history. So David, can you give us a quick definition of what you consider social history and what you focused on when doing this, please, sir? I suppose the, you know you know there are there different, different different elements, different elements to, the, to, the, uh, to to the history side of things. I guess you get the whole you know the the dates, the kings, the queens, the battles, this kind of stuff. Which we I think the phrase 1066 and all that kind of covers that. Then you've very much got a civil history, which is the you know the the laws and who ran what and who did what to whom and when and where. And then I think the tier below that in a way is the social history because. 
social history is about the people, the people who actually lived that time, the people who worked the land, the people who played, worshipped, whatever, you know, and married each other, went off and did whatever they did. And also the sense back in the day was that people didn't really travel very far. Certainly the majority of people really went beyond 10 miles of where they grew up. So there was a much greater sense of a collective. Most of them were tenants of the landlord. So there was a filial bond that they all shared, that they all had to pay the rent to the same guy. And that guy then was enthralled to the higher society and, you know, the, the, the kings, the queens, the lords, the lairds and the great and the good. So I think that the social history side of things is how that which is decided by other people would have an effect on the daily lives of individuals and not just decisions made by people. A large part of, of the story of Scotch, or at least the beginning of it, comes at the tail end of a period known as the Little Ice Age, which was a very cold and wet period in, in Northern Europe where you, you know, the Thames would freeze, for example, in London. I mean, that would be unheard of today. And that meant harvest failures. Now, 300 years ago, 250 years ago, there was no safety net. There was no government handout. If, if the harvest failed twice, you'd starve. And mm. so you, you, the unpredictability of the weather alone could have an effect. And I think that that, in a way, and I think the weather plus legislation or whatever might have been in play, was one of the reasons why whiskey took off as a byproduct of the agricultural world, because it was something you set aside for a rainy day. And rainy days are quite common in Scotland, contrary to common belief. Uh, you know, people say to me, where are you from? Or actually what normally people say to me is, what part of Ireland are you from? And uh, at which point I go, I've never been, and then just confusion reigns. And I, but I, people, oh, I come from Scotland. Oh, I went to Scotland and it rained. You know. Well, it's not the Atacama, of course. No shit. Uh, but, yeah. but, uh, so the, the, the need to have something as, a, as a, a guarantee of being able to trade it, to get corn or grain. So I think that the, the weather was a big effect. But the, the knock-on effect for the whole community, to, from not just the guy who's harvesting the grain, but the blacksmiths to the, to the, you know, the, the merchants for the grain and so on and so yeah. forth. Similarly, from a legislation point of view, the 1823 legislation which effectively made small-scale farm distillation uh, viable as a legal means of, 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 uh, of employment and, and money-making, ended smuggling like that. Uh, that had a knock-on effect within the Highlands because suddenly everybody's energies were channeled in different directions. So it was really looking at the story of... I mean, you could dive deep into this, and that's not where we go with this. But you could, but it really is a story of the people on the land who are at, I guess, what you would say, the business end or the front of house end of the story. Harder to get to that though, because in my mind, this is more of a an oral history. It, it's a history of the people themselves, but less documented. I know you can get the weather and you can find out what happened and droughts yeah. so far. But how do you get the other informational social history? How do you, how can is it through stories? Is it is it just the that that history passed down through the families maybe? There's oh. certain elements to that. Um and I guess and, and maybe it's a Scottish thing, but there was a lot of work done by uh, people who travelled to the Highlands in, in in the late 18th century, so the period following the Battle of Culloden, up until that point, people didn't travel to the Highlands, so up okay. until the mid-18th century. People went on, on vacation to places they expected to come back from alive, so they tended not to go to the Highlands. And it was really the, the breaking of the clan system that followed Culloden and then the sort of romanticizing of the Highlands that came with Sir Walter Scott and Robert Burns and so on. So people started traveling and very famously um, Samuel Johnson and uh, he traveled along uh, the Highlands with, uh, with Boswell and they wrote a lot and they really wanted to see a Highlands that may never have existed. This, this sort of created Highlands that, that Scott had come up with, but they were able to document. There was other travels like uh, Thomas Pennant, who was a Welshman who wrote a traveled extensively Similarly, Martin Martin, who was from Sky, and they wrote down those stories that you're mentioning that okay. actually were written down back in the late 18th, early 19th century. So we have that resource that we do know from people who were from there what was going on. Now, obviously, it's, it's skewed and yeah. it's, it's, it's suggested. All history is, I think. Absolutely. But we do have one very great resource, which comes from the late 
uh, 18th century, which was the statistical account of Scotland. So in, in the 1790s, every parish in Scotland, their minister was charged with writing a, uh, their basically a, a story of each parish, the civil history, okay. its etymology, its population statistics, but they all had their own bent on this. And so you would get, for example, there was, I was reading there was a, a minister from a parish in Ayrshire who was uh, bemoaning the Irish whiskey being smuggled into Ayrshire from the Isle of Man because it gave the smugglers money, which for some reason their wives went off and spent on fancy silk dresses. And it was and it was blurring the lines of social social standing. Uh, so it isn't it wasn't just dry, it was a snapshot in time of, of people's lives that disappeared within a generation. So there is that there is there are documentation, but a large part of it I think is stuff that you I guess you just absorb by osmosis. Okay, but that'd be fantastic hearing about what not a priest but a minister or minister, priest. yes, the church of Scotland would have said at that point. That's 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 kind of neat. I'd like to read through that. I think you should. Yeah. And you, they're all it's all available online. You can actually find that there's a there's this first statistical account was 1790s. You did another one in 1845, and you and obviously they're the same parishes. And the, 1845 went off and references back. And you can see the massive social change that has taken place within that generation in one parish or each any parish, any yeah. random one of the 700 parishes, you will find a massive difference from one that in cool. 30, 40 years. Well, I think I'll look that up, but I'll put the link in our, well, in the bios that we have in the different ones. We can do that. Mm. Uh, let's panel. Let's go back to you. Uh, so the beginning of chapter four, I believe, it says Rome was built on seven hills, Dufftown on seven stills. So David quotes this as a local saying, but gives no date on this. So panel, without any further information on date, what do you think those seven stills are? Throw some names up. David will tell us if we're right and wrong. Right. <laughs> I'll hold my fingers up. Well, I think you got us. <laughs> no, I don't know. Yeah. Give space side, guys. So the town of Dufftown. So I'll give you a clue. Dufftown currently has six working distilleries. Two of them are two of them. Sorry, no. Two, there's two of them that are very well known. The yeah. rest of them are maybe a bit more obscure. Balvenie, yeah. Balvenie. Uh, yep. Dufftown itself. Mortlach. Mortla. Yep. Yeah. McAllen. Um, nope. Nope. No McAllen. No McAllen. That's Archie's town. Uh, no Glenn Farkless then either. Nope. Uh, what about maybe. you? Glenn was too far away. And so is... Uh, you and... Ben Romick in there? Nope. No, they're all too new. Yeah. 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 I think older. It's... Yeah. Well, well it, there's a rolling yeah. time scale. The, 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 the town has used the phrase for, for some considerable time. So distilleries have changed their name. Well, not the names have changed, but when one is out, another comes in. Yeah. And so Balvinny, Mortlock, Dufftown, yeah. Glen Dullin. Glen Dullin. Yep. Uh, I don't know how to pronounce this. Caninvi? Well, no, no I, I, I get, well, now we get into the complicated part <laughs> of what should not be complicated. Um, <laughs> Kil well, Kilnilvi doesn't exist anymore. Uh, Kilnilvi was the, the, the greatest experiment in modern times, where Kilnilvi was built to be a, an absolute replica of Balvenie. It sits about 100 yards from Balvenie Distillery, with the same people working it, the same shape of stills, the same water source, uh, with the idea, because Balvenie's capacity just couldn't match the demand so they built a balvenie mark ii and the oh, whiskey yeah. the whiskey came out completely different uh <laughs> and so they had to scratch their heads and figure out what william grant were like ah what we're gonna do with this and then there's the one duff town distillery you haven't mentioned which is glenfiddich so uh so glen so glenfiddich balvenie and kilninvi were all basically juiced together to produce a vatted malt which unfortunately is now the day's terminology they call blended malts, but yeah, might be like vatted malt, and that's monkey shoulder. So you it's will drink, normal. you will drink Kilninvi if you're drinking monkey shoulder. Uh, mm -hmm. The other ones that were that you got, well, you didn't get Glenfiddich, but Glenfiddich, Balveni, Dufftown, Mortlach, Glendulin, the up until recently Petit Vey. 
Oh, so Petty Bay is a Duff Down distillery. Petty Bay. And uh, Park Moor was a distillery until the 1930s. So back in the day, they probably mentioned it. And Conval Moor. Conval Moor was up until the 1980s. And then Kilnan Bay was uh, added to it. So, but of the six distilleries yeah. that are left in Duff Town today, they produce 10% of all the single malts uh, of Scotland in, in those six distilleries. Nice. Wow. All right. Thank you very much for our participation, although we were off and we should have done it. I, I had them highlighted in the book. I just didn't want to go to the book. <laughs> and uh, But I, I am going to hit you with another quote. So we are talking about space side. So yet, even today, nearly two-thirds of all Scotland's single malt distilleries are to be found in this region, a testament to the quality of the water, the abundance of the barley, uh, and the legacy of the generations of skilled stillmen. So I want to highlight that because I, I find that to be a really important point. Mm -hmm. So this and the answers to the previous question will, of course, tell you that we're talking about space side. But I'd like to focus our attention on something that we do forget. So that the greatness of the distilleries, of the region, is sometimes obtained on the backs of the people. And that is indeed generations of farmers and skilled workers that helped this region gain its position in the world of whiskey. People are our greatest resource, and especially Scots, and maybe a few Irishmen like us, of course, could kind of claim a little bit of help in there. But uh, I like the fact that you do focus on, on the people, and we do forget about that. And I mentioned that last week about the farmers, where we kind of gloss over that sometimes. But obviously terribly important to the to, to everything to the yep. to everything that we do so uh david you mentioned that space side would be considered a great a graded whiskey region so i love this part of the book because i i don't know if i've heard this before where you talk about a and then two and then three four mm -hmm. great said it's an older system yeah but could you tell us a little bit about that please and when did they use it or when did they stop using it maybe I, I I think the the stopping of it was probably just after the Second World War. Uh, the The system really was developed by the uh, by the whiskey, or really utilized by the whiskey barons. I, I guess it began with Andrew Usher in the in the eighteen fifties, and and DCL when it came along in the eighteen seventies. Essentially, what what had happened was after eighteen twenty three, they had this this mushrooming of distilleries that just suddenly appeared out of nowhere to all intents and purposes. And the distilleries in Scotland, of course, are not just randomly scattered. It required, as we mentioned previously, that that particularly in Speyside, where you get the very cold, fresh water of the mountains, meets the rich barley country of, of the lower areas, and, and certainly mid to lower South Spey. And in these areas, Easter Ross, Highland Perthshire, Isla, although Isla's story is fantastic with, with the Shawfield connection, which we may get on to one point, but the space in particular, the conditions were right. So all these distilleries appeared in places like Dufftown and Archie's Town and Aberlour and, and in Elgin and Rothis. And they were all much of a muchness to a certain extent, but there was differences within them. And what the blenders wanted were whiskies that were light and malleable so that they could be mixed together uh, with the grain whiskies coming out of the likes of Kirk Liston or Cameron Bridge or North British and glue them together in such a way that if they tinkered with the, 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 the style or you know how fast they'd run the stills or what pressure they ran it at, what wood they chose, they could then, in a way, the tail would wag the dog. The blenders could then give a recipe to the distillers and say, this is how we want you to make your whiskey so that it will fit our blend X, Y, and Z because the blenders were... The market that's who you were selling to if you were a distiller after the 1840s when the bubble burst the only people buying your juice were the were the blenders mm -hmm. and so the blenders essentially categorized each of the stills in their blendability not in their quality of flavor per se or one is better than the other but their ability to be blended into a whiskey that was um i don't really want to use the word bland but simpler than the more complex flavors you would get from a single malt okay. and obviously less fiery than a, than a single grain would give you, which is what the genius of the blend was. So they, as they discovered, all what they called classified A, which was the top-notch whiskies that were good for blending, they all came from Speyside. 
Then the next column was column one, then column two, then column three. And the big yeah, column yeah. three whiskies were ones that were didn't necessarily mean they weren't great whiskies, but they their blend ability wasn't good. So those were the big heavy Campbell towns. Yeah. These were the big heavy Isla whiskies. You couldn't throw if you you can't throw you know something into like a, a, a like a monkey shoulder there, for example, or a Jew or whatever, and suddenly you threw a lag of woolen into the middle of that, you would skew that flavor completely. So yeah. that was where that, and it was essentially if you decided to be a blender, you could go to this this catalog for, you know, it's like some like Sears catalog, and you and you cherry pick the distilleries and you bought them, you bought your whiskeys from those distil distilleries. However, you wanted to make sure there was consistency coming out of those stills and also that they wouldn't go bust. Uh, that they would still be there 10 years down the line because consistency was king. The market wanted consistency, which single malt couldn't give you, barrel to barrel. That right. was what the blend was about. And so a lot of them ended up just buying the distilleries and they took advantage, particularly in the 1890s with the, the crash following the Patterson uh, scandal when a lot of the distilleries went bankrupt and they just got snapped up. And once they got snapped up, then the blenders could dictate exactly what those stills would make but if you weren't making for the blends, but certainly by the time David Lloyd George came along, your ability to be a, a, an independent was, was pretty much dashed. So the, the, this book of grading was, the, the I, I guess, the, the handbook upon which the blends were built. Do you know where someone like me would be able to get a copy of something like that? And it doesn't have to I, be I, I've, I've been looking for it as well, in a sense. Okay. I last saw it at the National Library in Scotland, the, in Edinburgh, the, the National Library of Scotland. Can you leave that with me? And I'll, I will, I'll come up with a, an answer for you. And I'll, I'll I'd love that. Yeah. Okay. It is out there, believe me. I didn't just make it up. Did I just make it up? <laughs> you can make it up. I'll believe you. And, and I think you, remember, I was a tour guide for twelve years. I mean, <laughs> you make yeah. stuff up all the time. I, I, what, no. The phrase is, "You only have to be one page ahead of everybody else in the book." Yeah, yeah. that's the same thing for teachers sometimes too when they first start teaching too. I think yeah, it's called right. flanneling. <laughs> Guys, we are entering the island section of uh, the language of whiskey. And David states the following. Ooh, I got another quote. Sorry. Yeah, let's get this. Uh, Scotland. Scotland is one of the most amazing places on earth. In a land of superlatives, the island of Isla holds a special place for me personally. So, panel. Uh, how many of you share this point of view that it has a, a place in your heart? Because I'm pretty sure three of you have been there. Or two, maybe a third. If no, because I thought she looked uh, that Nick was going to be on there tonight. Not, I'm pretty sure she's been there as well. Do you have that same thought where it feels special to you? Yes, very much. Yes. Yeah. Well, it is for me because I really like the whiskey, but I haven't been there yet. So I've just been to the main. I've been to the lowlands, and that's it. And that was my well, going with my wife to see. Or her, her family's plots and where it was before. So I haven't made it to Isla, and I really want to. But uh, I don't want to ask you for your favorite whiskey, favorite distillery, favorite whiskey, because I, I don't really like it when people say that to me because I can't really come up with a favorite. But I do want you to tell me, all of you, if you can, an Isla whiskey that you think someone should have now, something you've had in the past couple months that you think everyone should have on their shelves. So... We're going to start with uh, Sheila and Drew, and then we'll go, well, all of you have it. And then you, you Cheryl and Kent, and then Dave, I'll finish off with you, buddy. And then David. Sorry. David will finish us off. Not Dave. David. Are you, are you talking just a, like, a distillery? Do you want, like, a specific bottle? You're talking to a friend, and you say you need to get yourself this bottle here. Or if you can't find it anymore, here's a substitute. You two are good at that. Uh, I, I'd start off with Core of Reckon. Nice okay. choice. Yep. Yeah. So yeah. that one right there. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, because he went with the Core of Reckon. Fine, sure. Take that one. Um, from, from Sky. Uh, I would say. Well, you're, you're taking. Come on, we can do this. <laughs> and the fight is on. <laughs> um, I'd say, well, because he's he's 
because he's picked Corey Brecken. Um, maybe, well, because I can't have it anymore. Um, I can't take my favorite. Uh, I'd, I would I would have easily said uh, Brooke Lighty's Pete, but Brooke Lighty's Pete hasn't been around for a long, long time. Um, so maybe Boone is Schroeder. Okay, done. Kent? Anything on that top shelf. <laughs> no, you've got a friend. They've got $120 or $150. They're just new to it. They want to try something peaty. You have enough to show them stuff, but you say, go get yourself this to start off. You should have it. That one right there. I can't yeah. see <laughs> Carol, can you smack him and make him just tell me something? That's what I was thinking. There, Una. Which one? The teacher. Okay. Thank you, sir. Cheryl, do you have a favorite, Isla? I don't know that I have a favorite. It's truly Brick Laddie. Anything okay. Brick Laddie I, I yeah. loved. Done. So we'll go with the core Brick Laddie with you. Yeah. Done. Or anything Kalila. Oh. Kalila. <laughs> yeah. You got one, Dave? So for me, it's definitely this uh, Scarabus because it's the only one from Isla I got, so I got to go with this one. <laughs> okay. <laughs> you have to take that. And Whoops. I have a hard time because I like Lechag. I like Kill Holmans right now because I'm I'm I've been on the search for a Kill Holman that's been in port for a while, and I finally found one. So I think my mind's kind of around Kill Holman right now. So David, do you have a favorite Isla? I, I yes. Um, I'll I'll ramble into it as I usually do. I have been to Isla many many times, and it. it it never tastes better than when you're actually on the island. Uh, I I'll also that. will add on to that. I really like the Judas as well. Oh, uh, yeah. And uh, I, when I used to go to Isla, I used to stay in a hotel called the uh, the, the White Heart, and uh, they would especially get in Judas superstition for me. Uh, and I, actually, they got to the point where they would ask me if I was taking my group to Judas to the island, and I would just pick up the bottles from the distillery and bring them back to the hotel. But <laughs> I I did work for a couple of years for Bo more. And I think Bowmore More 15 is, uh, is a spectacular whiskey. And I had oh, the opportunity of, of the group of us that worked for them to be on Maca Bay uh, with the wind coming in off the Atlantic with the distillery manager at Bowmore shucking oysters while we were drinking uh, by pouring Bowmore into the oyster shell and drinking it on the nice. beach. So, you know, as I said, Isle is a very special place for me. But if there's one that you really did want to hunt down, and it isn't going to come into your $150 range, but is the old Kalila, the old Kalila flora and fauna. So Kalila I haven't found it. The Kalila 15. So when when I worked at Blair Atho, we were selling this stuff, the flora and fauna range, at 22 pounds a bottle. And Woo. the Kalila 15 at 22 pounds a bottle, we were like, ha Aberfeldy was even a, a flora and fauna. It was a Diageo, wow. well, it was a UDV brand at the time. And, you know, I was, I was 20. I was drinking the stuff like this going out of fashion and Good. then Diageo changed what they wanted to sell they went they, clearly as a 12 or an 18 this 15 just nailed it right in the middle so if you ever come across it it's like drinking an hard road smoky and i've been looking for a little while too and i've we've we've got a friend over here let's shake everything it's just hard to find yeah it is. but alberta is a great place to live for scotch it really is we we get a a, a huge chunk here that they don't do in ever provinces so uh we're very lucky but there's some that we just don't get and when i went to new york i was on the hunt and i thought i would get a whole bunch not so not, not so much not so much that's all right uh, it's all about the hunt i think sometimes but so david uh you do a fantastic job in uh describing the majesty uh and the beauty of the islands and you use the word tolkien-esque which made me really happy in there <laughs> But something unexpected piqued my interest. And on, I'm sure it could be a course into itself. It was a quick and fleeting reference to what you presented when describing the Alice Sky. You referred to the brutal clearances. Now, I did a, a, a quick little review, but I, I'd like to get your information or your view on the brutal clearances and what prompted it and what it was because i don't think a whole bunch of us in canada know what this is it, it, it's a little bit obscure specific to your history it's um interestingly enough because uh, a large number of the of people of scottish descent who live in canada are a direct byproduct of the highland clearances 
the you can get over emotional about the Highland clearances and and sort of and, and and go crazy on it. But what what really happened was that there was a massive social change took place in the years following the Battle of Culloden in 1746. The uh, the Highland clan chiefs had measured their wealth on the number of swords they could bring to a battle. Okay. And that that meant you needed a lot of people. And also the Highlands of Scotland was a very uh, strong cattle economy. So the hills of the Highlands would have been covered in black cattle. We think of Highland cows today, those ginger cows with the big horns. Well, that, that was really only from one part of the Highlands. Most Highland cattle were still shaggy with big horns, but were actually black in color, not, not ginger. They were known as black cattle. And when the government really cracked down following the Jacobite Risings, it brought in a lot of draconian measures. And But its most important thing it did was it, it really ended the chief being a chief and took away a lot of his rights, particularly to bear arms. So a lot of them swapped bearing arms and being their own kings in their own kingdoms to being colonels in the British Army. And so they, they simply swapped one for the other. And so you didn't need as many people and the cattle economy collapsed on top of that. And as this was happening, wool prices were climbing. And so sheep became something a lot more uh, profitable. And up until certainly the 1790s, they didn't think that black-faced Cheviot sheep could actually survive a Highland winter. Well, in 1792, they discovered they could. It's called in Gaelic, which means the year of the sheep. And that was the year that sheep effectively started replacing people in the, in the hills. The, the chiefs who were meant to protect the people went from being chiefs to being landlords. And the Highland population had exploded throughout the late 18th century. There was literally too many people in the Highlands. Taking an island like an island like the Isle of Skye, for example, today Skye's population is about 10,000, and that's a comfortable population for that island to support. Well, okay. in, say, 1820, that population would have been about 27,000, uh, and it really couldn't support that. So a lot of people started leaving, deliberately leaving. They were voluntarily leaving to pastures new, mainly in North America, and but also Australia and, and New Zealand. And the people who left were the, the sort of educated part of the, the community. They were known as the taxmen, not TAX, but they were people who were like the, the, the lawyers or the semi-gentry of the clan. They were like Psh, writing on the wall, we're out of here. And that left a power vacuum. And so once the price of wool started to increase, the landlords trying to keep their ends to meet together realized that you needed a lot of sheep and sheep do not need people. So people were, vol were not voluntarily removed. They were brutally removed by an aristocracy that was completely detached. So for people whose families had farmed the same land for generations, uh, yeah. they would get a knock on the door and said, you've got a week to leave. And they would be burnt out of hearth and home. And thousands, maybe, maybe 20,000 people, 30,000 people were forcibly evicted out of their homes. Uh, and a lot of them ended up in the coast. The, the Duke of Sutherland, who was the worst clearer of them all, he owned 1.1 million acres of the Highlands. He owned an entire county. Uh, considering the size of Scotland, 1.1 million acres was huge. And he moved a lot of his tenantry out of the valleys and up into the coastal areas. And on the east coast, is quite fertile. And he thought he was doing them a favour by um, turning them into fishermen, but none of them could fish. And uh, they said, well, we can still grow barley. He went, ah, I shall, buy, I shall build you a distillery. And you can sell your whiskey, your barley to the distillery. And so Pine Leash was born. Uh, so, the, but on Sky, yeah, thousands of people were evicted. And it's, it, it's part of our, as you say, it could be a course in itself, but it's part of the Scottish psyche that's been very hard to get over, which was the brutality that, by which it was done. A lot of it was inevitable, but a large part of it, the way it was done. And in 1999, one of the first things that the new shiny Scottish Parliament did once it was established in Edinburgh was the, the government apologised to the people of the Highlands on behalf of the Crown for, uh, for the Highland clearances. Sorry. So it's a ghost that we, we still, we're still struggling with. But, it, but it, its imprint and its footprint still, still lingers heavily uh, in the Highlands today. It's, it's, that, it's, it's a ghost that we still rankle with. Yeah. And it, it was interesting. I, I saw it, and, and it piqued my interest right there, right away, because I didn't recognize the term. But looking it up, it seemed quite brutal. And yep. 
let's leave it at that. You can, everyone can do your own little research on the clearances and just say the clearances and it'll come up. Yeah. It'll be one of the it first. Be, yeah, it's, it's, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Well, uh, it, to the lowlands, guys. So right. the lowlands section, really a tale of two cities. Uh, obviously not Dickens cities of London and Paris, but uh, the cities of Glasgow, which mean Gaelic for Green Hollow and Edinburgh, Gaelic for Fort on the Slope. Did I get that right? I think absolutely. Yep, Glasgow right. and Dunedin. Okay, uh, and we've we've discussed tons on Glasgow already. The people living in very dense population, sickness related to the water quality, the eventuality of the aqueduct from Loch Catherine coming to the city, so that that grand escapade, the the death rate finally surpassing the birth rate. No being surpassed by the birth rate in the mid 20th century. It took that long before they made more people than died. Nearly a million people in that city by 1900. So that's a massive city a hundred years ago. One element that I don't believe we spoke about was the Irish immigration. So I got the Irish roots in me, so it piqued my interest as well. So David, how much of an influence do you think uh, the Irish had on triple distilling scotch in that region? So the lowlands. And was this more a driving force than wanting to create a high ABV light spirit to counteract gin, which they're no longer having in England? So I'm wondering, was it more Irish people, more let's get a high ABV, or is it both? I would say uh, I, I tend on these things to go down the road of Occam's razor and say that it's uh, somewhere in the middle is probably the right answer. Uh, the Irish migration into Scotland really affected two cities more than any other, which was Glasgow and Dundee. And uh, they, put in, and in Glasgow, of course, that that legacy lives with us in the two big football teams in Rangers and Celtic. And uh, the the Irish immigrants, like the Highland immigrants as well, which so the Highlands are the Highlanders are being shoved out on the back yeah. of the clearances, and the Irish are coming over on the back of the famine. So they're coming into Glasgow, which was the second biggest city in the, the British Empire. A lot of them obviously were flocking to, to Liverpool. A lot of people were going to London. Yeah. And, but Glasgow was a big draw. And it came on the back of what doesn't really get discussed a lot either is the lowland clearances. So 50 years before the Highlands, a lot of lowlanders had been evicted as well, but not in the same kind of way. And this had been the population drive, as you said. Birth rates didn't match death rates until well into the 20th century. So a city that's growing exponentially and growing 10 times its own size within within a lifetime needs people to come from somewhere. And certainly from the 1840s onwards on the, on, in Ireland, a lot of them had come across seasonally originally from Ireland and then would go back. Similarly from the Highlands, people were coming south and then were going home with their pockets full of you know, Glasgow made shillings. And then they stayed and they eked out their, their, their living. And Irish whiskey is triple distilled, generally speaking, not ubiquitously, but generally speaking. And we tend to think of single malt Scotch whiskey as being double distilled. Well, double distillation yeah. was a Highland trade. It wasn't a lowland trade. And in the lowlands, there was multiple distillations. So it wasn't even triple distillation. It could be quadruple distillation. Okay. And the idea was to raise the ABV and was to, to bring it up to be very light. Uh, with the big players, the Kent Pans and the, the Kilbaggies of this world, they were running those stills, as I said last week, you know, he was running 12 charges an hour. So they, were not, they, they weren't interested in quality. They were making stuff that was just fire water. So the lowland malt distillers, uh, and there were a few in Rosebank and St. Magdalene, uh, Langham, distillers that would exist in well into the 20th century, were lowland single malt. Rosebank is perhaps one that we, we, we think of. And Rosebank is triple distilled. Ockintoshin, of course, is triple distilled. Yeah. And the legacy or the... Or the, the the narrative that we're given in as you grow your 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 career within the whiskey industry is that it's the Irish influence. I would beg to differ. I would say that the Irish influence may well be there, particularly in the Glasgow area with Auchentoshin, but I don't think that influence would have stretched across the lowlands. I think it was something that lowland whiskey making was very similar to Irish whiskey making anyway. Jameson whiskey the most famous perhaps of all the Irish whiskies was founded by a Scotsman from Hallowood, John Jameson. So I think that the processes in Lowland Scotland were very similar because of the need for what they were making to the market that it was going to. If you were selling whiskey to the Dubliners or people from Edinburgh, it's six or one and a half a dozen. It was the fact that it's not 
that there's a disparity between Scotch and Irish whiskey in that sense. It was the difference that the odd man out was the Highlander, just doing it twice. And you also talk about Cameron Bridge and the coffee stills at that point, which is similar to what was going on in Ireland as well. So great. Yeah. But let, let's talk about Edinburgh. Edinburgh has been a bit absent yeah. from our previous conversations. We don't talk about it a lot. And it, you said that it, it developed slightly differently due to its function as the seat of administration, politics, law, ban banking, scientific research, education, and publishing. North British is its whiskey monolith, producing 14 million gallons of spirit a year, which is pretty cool. It's a lot. I didn't think so much. And I do like some North British, and I once bought a birthday. I thought it was a birthday bottle, but it was 1968, so not quite my birthday. I was almost getting that. But as someone who's always looking for the unicorn out there, and Shu and Sheila, Drew, and Kent, and Cheryl, and Dave is doing this a little bit now. We're all looking for those unicorns. We are. And you mentioned a whole bunch of mothballed distilleries that may have a bottle available out there. And I got to thank you for that. I won't mention them, though, because people will have to buy your book to get that information. <laughs> I'm not saying it. No one say anything. Buy the book. But I really like that part, which is great. So thank you very much for that. Uh, we're going to get back to uh, the blends just a little bit. So blended with, oh, no, I got a quote. Get this up here. Blended whiskey. Of course it is. I love my quotes, man. Uh, blended whiskey makes up nearly 90% of total global scotch sales. We knew that. And as noted, blends are essentially grain whiskeys flavored with a selection of single malts. So we have a, a base whiskey and a flavoring whiskey. And we've heard that before. But panel, and David at the end, if we can, can you talk about when you first realized really what a, that a blend is grain whiskey blended with a single malt? Because for me, there's a specific time in my history when I, I could not repeat this because I always kind of knew that, but I didn't really think about it until kind of one point in time. And I want to know if a lot of you share that because I think you might have shared the same time with me. So, uh, panel, when did you realize what a blend truly was? Well, I'll and start, there's the book uh, right there. Uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Twelve years ago, when we started making single malt whiskey, I had to look I it up because I didn't understand. understand. I just and thought I it just, was industry speak to keep all keep of us uh, consumers confused. Okay, uh, Sheila Drew. I know the blends were um, blended. Um, Probably for, yeah, uh, I can't remember when it was. The one that floored me is when I found out that the single malts were blended just without the grain. That floored me. Yeah, a single malt is a blend at that distillery. Yeah. Yeah. It, yeah. That got me too. That, and you're probably eight years ago. I was thinking that like five or six years ago. Yeah. Maybe I'm eight and you're 10, something like that. Yeah. We've been doing this too long. Yeah. But uh, how about... I'm with I'm with Kent because I always knew it and I could repeat the definition of it and I could explain it, but I really didn't get the idea of it until kind of in here. And Kent, do you know the two terms that he talked about in here that we might oh. be thinking of? Yeah. Um, um, you're picking on a tired brain today. <laughs> uh, yeah, Davin was talking about the different types of blends in Canadian whiskey. One is the flavoring whiskey, and the other one is, I can't remember the term, it's the body. So the body gives you the body and, and, and the cohesion to the whiskey, and then the flavoring whiskey. And I never thought of it in those terms, that it was 80 90% corn or wheat depending where it was and then this small amount that gives it this kick this punch of flavor which is why i like single malts i think because it's all punch all the time but the blends are are beautiful and it's it's an integration of that mouthfeel that i like so much so uh let's go to you david when did you come? you've been in the industry you've been around for a long time but when did it kind of hit you that it was this and a little bit of this they well, in, in terms of uh, realizing that, that that difference between blends and, and 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 single malt, I think really began when I started working at Blade Athol Distillery, uh, okay. because Blade Athol is the heart of Bells. I think up until that point, I wasn't really thinking about it that much. You know, whiskey was whiskey, uh, and I think that I wasn't alone in that sense. That we probably all thought that 
of Bell's or famous grouse came from the Bell's distillery and the famous grouse distillery, because that's how the marketers really, in a way, subtly kind of play it. And yeah, we we did our tour around Glenathlon Distillery, showed people how the single malt was made. And then, you know, that whole exit via the store thing, the last part of it was we talked about how its role went into into the blend and the heart of the Bell's blend in terms of its grain is Cameron Bridge and, and North British. And so we, we had to talk about the 35, and Bell's sort of selling point was it has the greatest percentage of of single malt, or did at that time, greatest percentage of single malt to grain. It was 70, uh, sorry, 60 to 40. So it was 60% malt was uh, uh, grain and 40% malt, whereas Johnny Walker is 25, 75. Uh, so that was part of its selling point. It was 35 whiskies that went into it. And Blair Athol was the heart of it. And it also included Glen Kinchy and Dolphinny and Cardew and, you know, and, and Inch Gower and so forth. So we got to know a lot of it about the other distilleries that went into it as we were being taught this. And the one of the guys who actually came, we sat around the boardroom and in the, in the distillery. And the guy who gave us the story of it was a man called Ian Bell. And that was Arthur Bell's great grandson, who was still part of the industry. So here was the great grandson of an actual whiskey baron telling us about the whiskey that we were selling in, in, in the facility. So that was that was my sort of Paul on the road to Damascus moment of, of realizing that there was a difference. Now, when that was taking place, that's the late 90s, uh, 97% of all Scotch whiskey was, was blended. So today it's 90%. So the growth in malt whiskey, which mirrors the growth in bourbon whiskey sales, and measures the growth in other sectors like gin and tequila, that sort of the, the, the consumers become more sophisticated, more aware of flavor profiling, as opposed to just stick it all in the blender and hope for the best. And but uh, but yeah, that 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 would be my that was my my moment was uh, was working at Blairathol. And the problem, of course, is that when you when you think about it, is that when you're laying down your whiskey, you've got to imagine what your market's going to be ten to fifteen years down the line. So it's no point looking at figures on a spreadsheet today and second guessing what it'll be like in say 2025 uh, 2035 and the market didn't figure this out so when the whiskies we're drinking today was being laid down in 2008 for example they wouldn't have imagined what it was going to look like in 2020 from a single malt point of view and so they don't have enough single malt to get into the blends which is why Diageo had to build Rose Isle otherwise Johnny Walker wouldn't have enough juice and then what they end up doing was right we're going to have to start putting out non-age statements and we're going to have to work our wood management very cleverly. So instead of having a whiskey that's going to sit in a cask for 12 years and go out as blah, 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 single malt, it'll yeah. sit there for 10 years and then we'll take the whole volume and we'll shift it into a sherry cask for a year and a half and we'll call it double wood or sherry finish or whatever. And so by doing that, they were able to manage the cask. But when I worked at Blair Athol, they were doing, what, seven, eight batches a week. Today they're doing 17. Uh, so, and, and that is all, and, and people are like, well, that's all been driven by single malt. The single malt market has increased dramatically, but so has the blended market. Okay. Blend, it's just a percentage of a much bigger pie. Mm -hmm. and, and that's interesting because I didn't think wow. that. I would have thought that the single malt would have just been catching and catching catching and one staying, not stagnant, but the same. But you're telling me they're both going up. The both, well, really looking at global markets, when you look at the likes of, you know, if you take statistics out of China and India, and okay. like Brazil, it, oh. it just skews the whole thing completely because it's just a numbers game by the time you get to that stage. But uh, yeah, that, and those are still very blend driven. Or similarly, like such as like Glen Grant. So Glen Grant is not a whiskey you would normally stumble along, but that's like the fourth biggest selling single malt in the world because it's owned by Campari and it goes into their, their blends that they sell huge in Italy and in Greece. It's a huge whiskey market. And I'm glad you mentioned Glenn Grant because those of us here with the Alberta Scotch Society, we have a Glenn Grant tasting next Friday. So we've got Robin Cooper, so the brand <laughs> coming in. And Robin's uh, a great sure. character, right? You're going to have a lot. Well, my first job in New York was to work for Glenn Grant. So oh, uh, Robin, okay. Robin, uh, when I, when I, when I, this is my Robin Cooper impression. <laughs> well, when, yeah. I, when, I, when I first met David, when I, said, when I, said, I met David, I said, this fella, he could sell sand to the Eskimos. Okay. Uh, <laughs> that, so when you do your tasting, be, be fully prepared for Cooperisms. 
Oh, you happen. know what? We've already had them because uh, we did a tasting because this was a month and a half ago. We had a wild turkey tasting and we read the book. So the book, and I don't have that book here, my wild turkey book. Kent, do you have that or Dave? Mine's in my but, other room. Also another David. There's so many Davids everywhere. Um, but he, he wrote on the wild turkey. So we did that for three weeks. But then we had a tasting with our, our group that night. Not that night before we started to kind of preempt our book club. And uh, Robin was in that because they're owned by Cum Perry as well. Yeah, yeah. And uh, yeah, he stayed on. We have the after dram and you've been part of the after dram, but, but Robin was the after, after, after dram. We were, that doesn't we sound like Robin at all. One o'clock oh. in the morning. <laughs> and uh, Robin was going strong as a fantastic time. So well, Rob, Robin and I grew up about 12 miles apart. Uh, oh, nice. Yeah, he's from he's from Perth. I'm from Dunkeld, uh, and uh, I and he's a piper. He plays pipes as well. I don't play the pipes, but I'm part of the Atholl Islanders. We have a pipe band, and I, I have a feeling, a sneaky suspicion, that part of that local connection was how I got the job in New York. But I was I was the East Coast brand ambassador for uh, the Brown Spirits for Campari. So that was Morrison Bowmore. So that was Ochintoshin Bowmore and Glengarry, and then Wild Turkey. And so I would be I'd be talking. Bowmore 18 or Bowmore 25 in one bar, and then I would go over to Brooklyn and I'd be talking Wild Perfect. Turkey 101. Yeah. And the gear shift between the two was just was yes. incredible. And then you would get Jimmy Russell would come into the market with his with his gold sharpie, and uh, and you just have him signing bottles. But we bring Cooper into the market, I, and I, I yeah, and he because you'd all you'd have the tweed jacket, the whole thing. So my colleague who yeah. looked after uh, the West Coast in, in Los Angeles, he would take Robin out to places in the like the Mojave Desert. He's got the tweed jacket on, sweat. There's 120 degrees, and he's trying to sell wild turkey. Uh, yeah, he's oh, this, with, his, yeah. with his Scottish accent. It, yeah, it, it's perfect. It's perfect. Yeah, oh, well, yeah, you'll, yeah, Coops is a great guy. Well, everybody, stick around. Well, we've we've passed our hour by six minutes. Not so bad as last week. We're good. <laughs> Uh, that's all the time we have tonight, ladies and gentlemen. It's been fantastic. Uh, Drew and Sheila had to leave because they're doing a tasting promptly at 8 o'clock. So they said hi. You saw the comments on the bottom. So I want to thank the listeners. I want to thank the panel. Thank Dave, Drew and Sheila who are gone. Kent and Cheryl who are there. Uh, Nicole who typed in from home. And David. Thank you. It's nice been a pleasure again spending this night with you. I learned so much every one of these nights. It makes me so happy. I look forward to it all week. So, as always, ladies and gentlemen, here's the good company. Here's the good whiskey. Here's the good books. And here's the good conversation. And here's to seeing you all next week, Saturday, November 28th, for our Whiskey Book Club's fifth book, fourth edition of The Language of Whiskey. That one right there. <laughs> no, it's not my, hold your name. My wife told me not to put my yeah. fingers over your name. So you can't introduce the men and have that. So it's there. <laughs> and uh, next week we're doing chapters eight and nine. And as a final note, if uh, you don't want to miss a minute of these fantastic talks, uh, click like, click subscribe, and we'll see you all again. So, uh, ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much. And <laughs>